G'day, g'day. Welcome back. Another week, another webinar. Thanks for joining us again. You've joined the GP Supervision Identifying and Managing Medico Legal Risks. For those of you that have been to a webinar before, you'll know me. I'm Glenn, uh, CEO of GPSA, and tonight we've got Julie Brook-Cadden from MDA National, who have also sponsored this particular webinar, so we thank them very much. Uh, as you all know, this part of the webinar is very, very brief because you're here to, to uh, hear from Julie. So really quickly, thanks very much for joining us and as we always do, we'd like to acknowledge the traditional owners of the lands on which uh, you are all joining this meeting today around the country and pay our respects to their elders past, present and their families. Now tonight we had over 150 people again register for this webinar and of course managing that in terms of um, having that many people talking at once could get a little bit unruly so you are on mute. You have the opportunity to record your questions in the chat box down the bottom left. Uh, we will, as the moderators, keep an eye on that make sure that Julie's uh, aware of those questions that have been asked and uh, perhaps not answered and uh, we'll jump in uh, throughout the session so please do put your questions in there because an interactive interactive webinar is a really good webinar. Uh, we are recording this webinar so if you didn't make have the opportunity to make tonight you'll be able to watch it or if you have to duck off again you'll be able to see the recording of this webinar. Okay now you all know what the session is about and you all know from having watched or read the uh, biography of Julie uh, what Julie is, is about and her background. So I'm going to hand over now. Thanks very much, Julie. Thanks, Ben. Um, so tonight we've got a pretty action-packed seminar. We've got five case studies, and I know you're probably all hanging out for those. Um, so I'll spend quite a bit of time on those, and they are quite complex scenarios, but all of them are scenarios which have happened, tick it a little bit, but they're definitely real-life situations. So um, it's really important for you to understand what to do if any of these issues arise. There's, sometimes there's not always a right answer. Um, it, it can just be dependent on very, you know, certain variables. But we'll, we'll work our way through the case studies. Um, so the outline really just sets out what I'm going to talk about tonight. I'll start off, lawyers always like definitions, so we'll talk about um, what GP supervision entails, and then my favourite is talking about medical legal risks and case studies. We'll also do some. Uh, I'll also run you through some things to think about. I'll just summarise at right at the end, and then if there's anything um, that I can get to in terms of questions that have, haven't been addressed during the course of the webinar, I'll try and do that at the end. You might think um, if you. Uh, have a question that I'm not getting to it, but it may well be that I will be addressing that as part of the scenarios further down the track. So be patient, but if it is that I don't get to it, I, as I said, at the end I'll try and address it if you might like that. All right, so starting off with the definition of supervision, and this is one that I've extracted from the AMA uh, provision statement, and really we're looking at uh, provision of guidance and feedback on the personal, professional and educational development in the context of the trainee's experience, providing in order to provide safe and appropriate care. Now, if we look specifically at the definition of a GP supervisor, this is extracted from Susan Worm's um, research, and her definition is a GP supervisor is a general practitioner who establishes and maintains an educational alliance that supports the clinical, educational and personal development of a registrar. Um, and that's a really all-encompassing sort of definition. Um, in terms of what GP supervision involves, of course, you may be supervising medical students, you could be supervising pre vocational doctors, you could be supervising GP regents, uh, IMGs who are working towards a fellowship but not part of the registrar training program. Or um, the last category is GPs with conditions or undertakings in their registration. And although that is not, um, I wouldn't say it's frequent, 
it certainly is something that we see um, from time to time. So it is something that you could quite potentially um, be doing at some point during your career. Now this basically this again is from Susan Worm um, and it summarises um, or it, it illustrates all of the different aspects of a GP supervisor's role. So um, at the centre is ensuring patient safety because that is first, uh, first and foremost um, what your role involves. So um, you're not only being an expert clinician and you're not only uh, providing educational support, training, you're also advocating for your patients and you're making sure that they're safe as well. Um, part of the role of a GP supervisor also is to provide feedback and one of the most important things and you know, I've come to provide feedback myself, I know how it is, it's very difficult to give um, feedback that can be perceived as negative but when it comes down to protecting your patients or ensuring their safety, it's essential that you give it where it's warranted and you can do it constructively um, and you can do it in a way that um, allows the, the trainee or the GP bridge to feel supported um, in so doing. Okay, so looking at the Medical Board of Australia's guidelines, these are extracted from looking at specifically at um, the guidelines on supervised practice for limited registration. Now that's not directly applicable to GP supervision per se, but a lot of the content of this is very, very um, similar to the approach that I would expect you to take. The main difference that I found when I was looking at these um, guidelines on supervised practice for limited registration was the, um, it's very prescriptive in terms of the level of supervision. So this focuses on you know, level one supervision, which is basically the sick patients together, level two, um, a little left involved or direct on site um, availability and then uh, level three which is um, shared responsibility and the off-site and level four really is where you're just every once in a while um, or at an agreed interval looking at um, the ledgers or the, um, the trainees management of patients. Um, now the most important things that come out of these guidelines is again patient safety. So ensuring that your supervised doctors not placing patients at risk, properly addressing any problems that are identified um, and even with, you know, if you've got a GP reg who's at the end of their training, you still need to have um, appropriate supervision for their level um, and provide constructive feedback. Uh, if it is that you've got a GP reg at the beginning of the training program or at the beginning of their practice placements, then of course they're going to require a lot more supervision and you're going to have to have pretty stringent um, uh, guidelines in terms of contact and that sort of thing. Um, as part of the orientation I would expect and the expectation is definitely of the board and of other entities that you discuss their role and responsibilities and you clarify their skill level and abilities. I don't think it's unreasonable to assume if someone's had a number of placements that there would be a certain level of skill or there would be an expectation regarding um, capacity and competence, but it's not enough simply to assume that someone is at the required level simply because they're at a certain stage in the training. Um, you, you still need to satisfy yourself that um, they are practicing at an appropriate level or that the procedures, etc., that they're going to perform are within the capacity of those. Um, regular feedback is also really important, as I've said. And one of the, in terms of managing risk, um, you know, you can't ever eliminate it, but the more proactive you are and the quicker you get onto problems, the easier they are to manage. It's often really, really difficult um, when something has progressed down a certain path try and retrieve a situation. So if you're able to identify a problem early, addressing it early is you know, absolutely the best way to go. So 
When we look at the Medical Board of Australia's Good Medical Practice, this is the code of conduct that's on their website and it's in the, the codes, policies and guidelines section of the, the Medical um, Board section. It says that the expectation with regard to good medical practice for GP supervisors and for all those involved in teaching and supervising is becoming an effective teacher and making sure that you provide adequate oversight and feedback. And that again comes back to make sure it with the skill level and capability of the person that you supervise. Um, again, the importance of providing constructive feedback is emphasised and it actually is enshrined in the code of conduct that um, not addressing issues, providing feedback that is not a code that the government deal with issues as you find them and place your patients at risk. Okay, so what are the consequences of failing to identify risks? Well, the best case always is that it's a near miss, that it's an injury or a problem has been averted and it's really just a learning exercise. And hopefully, you know, if you're going to um, have a situation where um, a medical Medicaid level risk emerges, it will be one where no, no harm is caused. The worst case is where you've really got a catastrophic injury um, to a patient, um, resulting in uh, you know, substantial injury or even death. That in itself can lead to things like um, the making of a complaint, and if a complaint goes to a statutory body such as the Healthcare Complaint Commission or ARCA, or the Medical Council in New South Wales that can um, proceed down an investigative pathway uh, resulting in the bringing of a, or the, um, uh, the bringing of a, a disciplinary hearing. Um, uh, and that if, if a matter proceeds to hearing, and if they are in the vast minority, so the majority of complaints don't proceed down the disciplinary pathway, but where there are serious adverse costs suffered by a patient and there is a problem, then it's more likely than not will proceed towards a, a disciplinary outcome such as a, a hearing. Um, there's always the possibility of rep reputational damage. Um, you uh, would be aware that patients who are agreed tend to say something about it and they may well say it on social media. Um, we all see the current affair, we see other programs like that which give people, um, I suppose, a forum in which to, to ventilate their concern. But there are so many online forums now, there's Rate MDs, there's um, uh, Best Sydney Doctors, there's all sorts of um, avenues for patients now to, you know, anonymously um, and often anonymously provide feedback um, which can be really damaging to your reputation. And finally, I guess one of the consequences could be an employment issue um, being that it may have ramifications for your employment at the practice, it may have ramifications for the trainee or other, other people as well. Um, so again, identifying medical legal risks at risk having an awareness of them and a plan as to how you're going to address them if and when they arise is really important thing to do. Um, now, look, I've just said a comment saying <laughs> why would you want to be a GP supervisor? You've got to remember, I, I say all of this because I, I'm seeing um, the, I'm seeing things that go wrong. So I, I often have to tell myself, I have to reality check myself as well. I see probably the top 5% only um, where things have gone wrong and for the remainder of the 95%, that's fine, I never see it. So I have quite a, I suppose, a distorted view in terms of how frequent things happen and the risks that um, arise. But when you actually look at the vast majority of um, GP supervisors, you know, it's not something that I would I would think is going to mean that you shouldn't be a GP supervisor. Just be alert and, um, as I said, knowing what to do when something goes wrong uh, is you know one of the most uh, helpful things that I can 
stay tuned tonight. And um, I hope that it will be of assistance to you, should, hopefully not, but if, if, if something does happen, that you're able to know where you can go and know what you can do. Okay, so in terms of easy to, to pick Medicaid level risks, when I look back at the sort of matters that we get um, that involve GP supervision, one thing that I suppose in terms of comes up again and again is failing to check the skill level and competency. So at, that's why I said earlier, um, you need to satisfy yourself. It's not enough to read previous places reports or previous reports or to assume that if someone's progressed a certain way to a program there, they've got the appropriate skills. Um, you do need to make sure that you're comfortable with your expertise and capacity as well. You need to also be very clear about what procedures um, your supervisor or supervisor is able to perform. Um, it may well be that your uh, the supervised doctor is able to perform procedures that you aren't insured to perform. Now, you need to be very careful with your insurer as well, um, checking that uh, if, if, for example, uh, a, a supervised doctor is has the appropriate qualifications to perform a procedure, whether or not it's appropriate that you supervise them and say, so if, 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 if you have any concerns about whether or not that's something you can do. Um, you also really need to set out um, the criteria. So these are the must call. So is it whenever there's a seriously ill child you want to be contacted? Is it whenever you've got um, uh, tutoring you want to be contacted? So starting out at orientation, hopefully, you'll be able to um, identify exactly what situation should trigger um, you being involved in the patient's management. So again, we come back to the level of supervision you provide must be appropriate. Um, and as I said, you can't get rid of all the risks. You can minimise them, um, but it's knowing what to do if they eventuate. Okay, so I'm going to talk to you about um, five different scenarios, all of which should um, you start with thinking about how you would react in um, should this happen to you um, and where you go. So we'll start off with the inappropriate prescribing case study. So this involves GP Reach doing their first placement. Um, she's, she's a very likeable um, Reg. She's keen, she's willing to learn, but she does have a problem saying no when she's got demanding patients. And this is something you've discussed with her, and it is, it is something that you know will become easier when she's got a bit more experience. So the situation is you've got a call from the local hospital. One of your patients has been admitted following a, a medication overdose. The ED reach that calls you says that the um, your patient took too many oxycontin tablets. You have a look at the electronic notes and see that your GP reg has given the patient a script for oxycontin 20 milligrams PRM for a shoulder strain. And when you have a look at the notes, there's nothing in there to indicate that an examination was performed. So I guess when you have this sort of scenario, you want to start thinking about how am I going to manage this? There's obviously an issue in relation as a knowledge issue, um, but how am I going to manage it? What do I need to do? And even working out the sequence in which you should um, tackle things is really important as well. So from an insurer's perspective, what I would suggest you do first of all is sit down with Dr Jo. You need to understand why did she prescribe oxycodone? Hold on. Codone, because that's a pretty hard hitting medication for a shoulder strain. You would think that she would start off with more simple analgesia. So you want to know, uh, did the patient ask for it? Um, is it something that she's seen prescribed somewhere else and thought was appropriate? Um, 
what you're doing at this point is trying to understand the reasoning and, and the level of concern that you need to have about um, what she's done. So I guess what you need to be satisfied is whether or not she's got insight and she understands the inappropriateness of her prescribing. If, for example, Dr. Jo said, look, I'm really sorry, um, you know, Michelle's really demanding. Um, I know we've discussed about um, prescribing, uh, about saying no to patients, but, you know, I was really put on the spot and she kept on how painful it was. Um, so if there's a, a reason as to why that path was followed and there is awareness as to how she would act if she were faced with a similar, similar um, clinical situation, then the path you take in terms of what you do may be different from a registrar that, um, you know, completely insightful or thinks that she's, there's not a problem with the approach that she's taken. The other thing that I see time and time again is um, many practitioners are not aware of the SA prescribing requirements and they differ from state to state. So um, I've had matters where even supervisors aren't aware that in certain situations such as where you believe there's a reasonable apprehension that the person may be drug dependent, you can't prescribe SA medication. So it may well be that both of you need a refresher or she certainly does um, and she may, might actually need specific education in SA prescribing. And as a result of your discussion with her, you might agree going forward that she's not to prescribe SAs without your specific approval. Um, and um, or you might formulate, if she's thinking of prescribing SAs, it's got to be something that you both agree to. Um, Dr Jo should also notify her insurer um, because she will get different advice um, and you can't advise her per se. You can discuss what's happened. But in terms of if the patient makes a complaint, then she'll need to get her own independent advice um, from her own insurer. And your insurer and her insurer will have slightly different perspectives. Okay, so I would also suggest that you talk to your insurer because I guess what you want to do, and, and from our perspective, we'd rather know when something like this happens. And most insurance policies have a, um, a requirement that you notify of any potential claim or incident. Um, so again, this issue of what you do, um, you want to have had some sort of discussion with Dr. Joe before you ring because and actually you could do either. So you could ring as soon as it's happened and, and set some advice or you could ring and then I would say to you, look, these are these are the steps that you need to take. What I suggest you do is first talk to Dr. Joe and then get back to me and we'll talk about which, which pathway you need to follow. Um, mandatory notification is always something that needs to be considered because um, you have an obligation under the national law in every state and territory to notify if you form a view that some, uh, the patients have been placed at significant risk because someone's um, practices represent such a significant departure from the sets of standards. Um, if you have concerns as a consequence of this as to the level of supervision, um, she might require or as to competency and capability generally, you might want to do a review of a certain number of a patient, like a random review for 10 files, 10 patient files or something like that. Just have a look at them and see whether they're getting further concern and consider whether you need to go back to sitting, she needs to sit in with you or you need to sit in with her on a certain number of patients. Okay. Um, so another thing you're going to discuss, of course, is uh, with your insurer is how you approach the patient. Um, are you going to call the patient in? I mean, this is once she's um, recovered from her illness, but confronting these things and talking to the patient, particularly if you know the patient well, um, it may be much easier for you to sit down with the patient, or you may agree that perhaps the Dr. Joe will come in and sit in with you. Um, Again, that's something you can plan. And I always think discussions like this where things have gone wrong, you need to really sit down and work out what you feel comfortable saying, whether there are any things that you shouldn't say, and 
most insurers now are very supportive of an open disclosure type process. So where you identify an issue or an error, being upfront about what's happened. Um, what you do need guidance about is this, the word it has to in, in New South Wales, for example, there is specific statutory protection under the Civil Liability Act so that if you make an apology to a patient, an apology of responsibility, I'm sorry this has happened or well, this went wrong, it cannot be used against you in the claim. It doesn't, it's not viewed by a court as an admission of responsibility. So you just need some guidance about how you, can, how you should apologise. Um, you will see in the media that um, politicians are, are very notorious for saying, I'm sorry if I did something wrong. Well, that really won't cut a good patient if something has gone wrong. So but what you say and how you say it's really important as well. Um, sometimes when you meet with patients, you won't necessarily know what's gone wrong. So it's just being honest and upfront about what, what you understand has happened, giving the patient an opportunity to talk, and then talking about next steps. Again, another thing I would suggest you do is to notify the training provider. Um, now, in terms of how much questions is coming in, how much blame will be placed on the supervisor, again, it depends on the, and I know lawyers don't like to answer questions directly, but I'll preface this by saying, look, it depends on things like um, how did your orientation go, did you set boundaries, did you, well, did you set expectations in terms of prescribing? Is this an issue that should have been discussed previously? Um, were you providing appropriate supervision? All of that sort of thing. Um, so it will really depend on what's gone before. Um, generally, the view is um, a, a registrar who is at the beginning of their training requires more supervision than others. So um, if you're not providing that level of supervision, then you, you may well have some responsibility there. Okay, so the next one I want to talk to you about is something that, um, again, may seem quite incredible, but this is something that is, that it is a real life scenario. So you've got a, a supervised um, uh, doctor um, who's doing final placement at your practice, uh, you're very happy with their clinical skills um, and all is going well. However, you get one of your regular patients come in and she says to you um, that her 16-year-old daughter has been going to see Dr David but she hasn't been seeing him at the practice. She's actually been seeing him after hours at his home. She knows this has happened on three occasions. And she says that her daughter, Dr. David, has given her daughter several scripts for Xanax. What she's done is she's taken a photo of one of the scripts off the phone. And you have a look at the photograph, and it, it seems to be a script written by Dr. David, Xanax, with three repeats for the poll. What do you do? Absolutely, it's boundary issues. Okay, what you want to do is you want to get your ducks in a row. So this is, you have objective evidence, you've seen the script, and if there's always the possibility that that image is not correct. But I think if you have a look at it and you're satisfied that that's appropriate, that that image is correct, you have an obligation to act on it. So what you want to do is you want to go to the clinical notes. Is there anything in the clinical notes to indicate that he's been seeing a cold? And I would suspect not. Is there anything in the, your records that indicate that Medicare's been billed for this? Um, I would also be checking with the local pharmacies because um, particularly in um, you know, regional and rural communities, you do know your local pharmacists very well. Often they will be the ones that tip you off if something goes wrong. But if you are on notice that there's a problem with prescribing benzos or another medication, then what you want to do is to check into benzos or another medication. Then what you want to do is to check and see whether it's been identified as an issue with the um, pharmacy as well. Depending on the information you get, um, it may, the next step may well be speaking to the drugs and poisons unit. 
or pharmaceutical services and notifying them that there appears to be a problem with um, the prescribing patterns of um, one of your trainees. Um, so I guess the first thing I would suggest you do, ring your insurer because you're going to need to have a very lengthy discussion about um, what, what you need to do. Prima facie, the fact one, seeing female, young female patients are prone to prescribing benzos, three outside the work context, it is um, undoubtedly um, a mandatory reporting um, situation under section um, 140 of the um, national law, depending on the state or territory you're in. Now, someone's just asked whether it involves the police, it may well have to. Um, I guess it depends on the information that you get, uh, what, your, um, what you turn up when you start going through patient records, Medicare billings, talking to the pharmacist. Um, you're going to, so the things that you're going to need to discuss with, and you are going to need to talk to him, but what you want to know is you want to objectively determine what has gone on. Um, objective external contemporaneous evidence will come from the pharmacist, it will come from um, your review of the clinical notes, it will come from the Medicare bills, all of that sort of thing. And I think um, I would want to be pretty certain, I mean, the fact that a script is reportedly written by him after hours is something that is that you cannot ignore. You do want to give him the opportunity to explain if you can, but you also, if, depending on what you find when you go through the notes and you do an audit of, of practice information, um, you may well um, have no alternative other than to take certain steps prior to speaking to it. If, for example, the pharmacist discloses something to you that um, escalates your level of concern, then you may need to be talking to ensure about the place. I guess, conversely, there is the, um, the chance that the script could have been written fraudulently by um, the patient, and that's something I suppose you need to um, consider as well. But given the, the possible ramifications of what's happening, you need to make sure that you're discussing with your insurer the steps you need to take. And look, I agree. Um, there's also a, a, a question about whether you will on the doctor's period or output. No, you don't want to do that. Um, and it may well be that your insurer is going to say to you, okay, well this is the this is what we need to do. Um, all of these things in terms of um, checking with the pharmacy, um, because Say you ring the pharmacy and the pharmacist says no, there's no issue with prescribing. I haven't noticed any change in SA prescribing as they know. I haven't noticed any increase in the scripts for benzos that have been um, provided by patients. Um, if you get that sort of information, then the veracity of the information that's been provided by Mrs. Lee will be diminished. So again, that sort of information, what you want to do is you want to there are, there are two ways this could go. It could be that your Mrs. Lee's suspicions are confirmed by the evidence that or the information that you get from sources such as the pharmacy, or it could be that you then have real concerns about whether or not the, the script has been forged, which in itself raises another question because if it is that you head, head down the path of the patient's daughter having forged the script, that again will be something where the police will be involved as well. So, although we might think this is something that will proceed down a path where Dr. David's done something wrong, it may well be that the information that you obtain from other, from external parties, do not support in any way the assertion that's been made. So, there, I suppose there are always two ways of looking at it. But if we proceed down the path where we do get confirmation from the pharmacist that there's been abnormal or um, if they've had concerns about prescribing and they've noticed the demographic that it has been prescribed to. Um, there is information in the practice records to indicate that Dr. David is um, writing that he's seen these patients when they're not seen at the surgery, for example. 
that in itself may lead you down the path of having to take certain action. Okay, so again, um, I have found um, when there have been issues in relation to prescribing, um, the duty pharmacist at um, in New South Wales, the pharmaceutical services unit, has actually been really helpful. So um, again, what we do will be dependent on um, what information we obtain, and that will influence the course you take. Okay, so assuming that you get information to suggest or to indicate that Mrs. Lee is correct, um, then you're going to have to, at some point, talk to Mrs. Lee. You're probably going to have to talk to your daughter as well. Um, and you're going to, again, on the presumption that the report, the, the prescribing is inappropriate and um, Mrs. Lee is correct, what you're going to need to have to do is to have a chat with them about what you've done, um, the steps that will be taken, and if it is that a mandatory notification needs to be made, um, then you'll need to explain to Mrs. Lee, and again, this is something your insurer can help you with, exactly what has happened, the steps that you've taken, the fact that they may be contacted, um, referring them on to um, colleagues or to the rated psychologist or something else may be appropriate as well. But I guess there are always two sides to a story and you know it is important to try and obtain external verification if you can. And it might be that until you speak to your insurer you don't really know, you're not going to take any steps and you're not going to start pursuing external information. Um, but again, once you you can't even if you suspect that something might be fraudulent, given this very serious nature of it, you can't just disregard it. You want to satisfy yourself that um, uh, there's a problem. Um, and then it's not your role to present all the evidence. What you need to do is to satisfy yourself that there is a basis for it, and then you're going to make a notification, or then you're going to make a report. Okay, so the next one is failure to follow up. Um, so we've got uh, Dr. Mike who's in the second year of his DP training program and the final week of his rotation. Yes, I've just sent a note, document all the way, absolutely. Um, so he sees Ruth, Ruth's 54 years old and she has chronic asthma. She comes in, she's having a, an acute exacerbation of her asthma which she has not frequently. He prescribes prednisone 25 milligrams daily and asks Ruth to come back in a couple of days to see how she's going. However, Ruth, who can be a bit scatty at times, doesn't understand or doesn't hear or doesn't um, follow for whatever reason. She doesn't come back for two weeks. And then she puts an appointment to come in and see you um, and she says, oh, um, I need a refill of my prednisone suit. She discloses to you that she's still taking some five milligrams of prednisone daily. And she also wants to discuss her concerns about suddenly having put on weight. Uh, you, so this is in the consultation, you have a look at the notes and you realise that for whatever reason Ruth hasn't been handed over, um, you'll have a note saying that you got it following Dr. Mark's departure. So what are you going to tell Ruth? Um, she's in the room with you now. Ideally, we would say, pop out and make a quick call to ensure, but that may not be practical. Um, I guess the, the, the key always to something like this is ordering your thoughts, even if you have to step out for a minute, and just work out how you're going to tackle it. Um, if you're able to, I mean, if you, what you could do is say, um, I just need, to, um, I need to do something for five minutes, I need to make a call. I'll be back in five or ten minutes. Um, or ask for to wait for you. If you are able to obtain, to give your insurer a quick call, what we would help you do is to plan what you're going to say. And um, you know, just the structure of what you would say um, and how you would say it. And really, as I said, open disclosure is such a feature of um, uh, 
clinical practice now that um, you know we most insurers will encourage you to be upfront with the patient. What you don't want to do is to drop Dr. Mike in it and to be you know scathing of what he's done to say look you know um, well if you're lucky you can't see me or you know you could have died. You want to say look you want to be upfront, you want to be factual, um, and you want to just tell it as it is. And matters where things go wrong, I can I can tell you that where a colleague has um, amplified a patient's concern, they've gone to see someone else and they say, Oh, thank God you found it so you know, things would have been so much worse. It has such a profound impact on the patients as well. So um, you need to think about how the patient's going to perceive what you say as well, particularly if they're going to be upset about um, what has happened to them. So be upfront. You want to say you you you're basically going to you need to tell her what's happened. So for whatever reason, um, her prednisone like, hasn't been reviewed. Um, she prednisone was the appropriate medication for her um, uh, exacerbation of um, asthma. But it's something that the dosage of this steroid needs to be uh, regularly reviewed. It should have been reviewed after a couple of days. Um, you're really sorry that this has happened and that she's received a higher dose of prednisone than she ordinarily should have. And it might well be that if she'd come back after um, the, um, after three days, you would have taken it or you would have, you know, she might still have been on prednisone. Um, so you can't, you can be almost certain that things would have been different, but you need to say to the patient, look, um, this is what's happened, this is ideally what we would have done, I'm really sorry that this has happened. Um, and you also want to say, um, what we're going to do, okay, so next steps are, you know, I'm going to refer you off to a specialist. Um, this is the likely, um, well, you might not know then, you might say, look, I'll, what I'll do is I'll facilitate a referral for you. I'll give the specialist a ring. Um, they may well be able to give you some idea as to you know, what sort of things you will need. Or you can say, um, I'll ring the specialist. Um, I'll give you a call after I've spoken to them, and um, you know, we'll fast track the referral. Again, it, it really is depending on, on how, um, how things go. Now, questions come up that says, do you need to give patients or everything in writing? No, you don't. Um, but I think if the patient's on a medication like prednisone, um, which can have long-term consequences if it's continued um, beyond what would be expected, then you just want to make sure that the patient understands that they need to come back. So whether that's writing, whether that's making, you know, you need to make a follow-up appointment in three days' time, you want to have something in the notes which shows um, Whoever is taking over or whoever reviews them, that the patient's been given, you know, you've explained to the patient that this is a medication that's for short term use, but they need to come back up for X amount of time. Um, as lawyers, we would like you to give all patients instructions in writing, but you can't. You would never see any patients if you did that. So I guess from our perspective, we would think the more the potential side effects of the medication are, the greater the duty or the onus on them to make sure the patient's understood what they need to do and what to watch out for. Okay. And again, your discussion with Ruth may go um, really well. Um, I once had a uh, specialist ring me from here to say that operated on the wrong side and um, you know, how are they going to tell the patient what were they going to do? And both of us thought the patient would be extremely angry. But when the patient, um, so we spoke to the patient in recovery and then when she's back on the ward, and she was surprisingly understanding. So all of the nat natural assumption is that patients are going to be really aggrieved if something goes wrong. You don't know. Um, if things go really badly and the patient says, oh, you know, is very dissatisfied with what's happened. You can always offer transfer of care. Um, what um, we see with complaints is patients wanting to know, okay, well, this has happened to me, then 
Um, what are you going to do to make sure someone else doesn't go through that? So, you know, if there are simple things you can make, such as if you have a GP bridge, to make sure that um, all of the patients that they see are um, the next review. I don't know, there might be some uh, way that you have of ensuring that they may well be that any patients for which certain medications have been prescribed are to be specifically handed over before the registrar leaves. There may be a, you know, a simple measure that you can take to, to try and avoid a similar error from occurring. Um, sometimes patients will be incredibly aggrieved. Um, it is their right to make mistakes if they want to. And if you know, if a patient says to you, well, look, that's not good enough, I'm going to take this further, it's their right to do so. Um, so um, that is something, you know, I wouldn't have an argument with the patient if that's what they want to do, I'll just respect your right to do that um, and just push them on. Okay, so um, you also want to let Dr. Mike know, and I guess that's the final thing. Um, Dr. Mike should let his insurer know because if, for example, the patient has a final claim against them, against him, well then, you know, you don't want that to suddenly lobby in without any warning. He should know and he should be able to also obtain some advice from his insurer as to what is going to be for him to do with this event. Okay, so um, the next case study is a, a missed diagnosis. So this involves one of your, your regular long-term patients, Stephen. He's a 65-year-old man who's generally well, except for the fact that he's on warfarin without a past PA. PA sorry. Um, the answering service tells you that the only information that has been given is that Stephen can't get up from his chair. You visit Stephen at home um, and it's apparent that he has unilateral weakness. You call an ambulance and you ask them to take him to hospital for further investigation. He's subsequently found to have an acute one chronic subdural hematoma. So the next day when you're back at work, um, you have a look at the notes and you see that your um, supervisor, Dr. Dr. Lena, has had two complications with Stephen during the last fortnight. Dr. Lena, the GP reg, who suspects him to his placement as your practice. So, um, he's written good notes. You can see that Stephen has given a history to Dr. Liam of having headaches um, over the past several weeks. He says that he's going through a really stressful time at the moment. He's just separated from his long-term partner. He hasn't been sleeping well. Um, he has been feeling dizzy and unsteady, um, which he thinks is probably due to the fact that he's just not been able to sleep at night. Um, Steve, uh, Dr. Liam has written very clearly in the notes that he believes that likely diagnosis is such headaches. So his plan of management is that Stephen tries simple analgesics such as Panadol and see whether that improves his headache. Um, given that Stephen is so stressed and not sleeping, he's had a GP mental health treatment plan because Stephen has agreed that he would like to see a psychologist. There are specific instructions in there um, about Stephen coming back if his headaches don't improve, get worse, or symptoms change. And there is actually an appointment scheduled for Stephen the following week. So you're going to need to discuss this with Dr. Liam. Um, and headaches, um, you know, 95% of the time it's going to be something benign. But when it's not, it's often really the consequences are not good. So again, this is probably something you'd want to discuss with your insurer. So um, uh, and um, also you're going to need to talk to um, Stephen about what's happened. And again, your insurer can just help you plan. And difficult conversations. You know, I'm not saying that it will go better um, if, if, well, actually, I do believe that they're easier if you're prepared. And what I often do with doctors that bring up for advice is that we can do a bit of, well, what are you going to do if the patient says X? Or what if the patient raises this? Um, and that just allows you because um, it will be a stressful situation for you and probably for the patient as well. And if Stephen's a long-term patient of the practice, 
Um, ideally, he's someone that you would like to retain as a patient. And how your discussion with him goes to make a difference as to whether or not you can salvage the therapeutic relationship. Um, you want to also talk to Dr. Liam. You want to, someone's asked, did he do a physical examination? That's a really important question. So you want to understand, was there any, were there any, you're assuming there were no red flags. Um, was there anything in the history he obtained from Stephen about the nature of his headache? Um, uh, you know, did he describe these as sudden and severe? Um, so you want to just understand exactly what the thinking, what his thinking was at the time. And tension headaches are not an unreasonable diagnosis, but in someone who's elderly and on warfarin, the possibility of a more severe cause of the headache is something that you need to bring in mind to. You want to also talk to Dr. Liam about what's happened, what you found, what his diagnosis has been. Um, you want to, I suppose, hear from Dr. Liam as well, something that reassures you that this is a lesson that he's learned, something that reassures you that this is a lesson that he's learned, that in the future he will be more mindful. Um, it may, I'm not saying you should do a neuro examination. Um, yes, we do work a lot of power with jaws. jaws. Um, I'm not saying do a neuro examination every elderly patient on Northland who has a headache. That would be, that would, again, that would be ridiculous and I certainly wouldn't advocate that. But what you want to do is to have your supervised doctors thinking about potential worst case scenarios. And again, you know, I realise that because of the work I do, I'm seeing that very small percentage where things have gone catastrophically wrong. But I suppose it happens often enough for us to think that it's something that you need to be mindful of. You're always you're not going to be looking for zebras all the time, but occasionally, you know, if someone's dizzy, if they're on more prone, um, if they've got bad headaches, that's probably something you just need to perhaps obtain more information about as well. And again, you need to tell Dr. Liam to notify his insurer because if a claim is made, um, then you know it, it will most likely fall to his insurer. Um, there is no um, absolute in terms of whether or not you would have involvement. Again, it will depend on the level of supervision. Um, you know, if he's a competent, capable practitioner who um, requires a minimal supervision, then the expectations in terms of your involvement are less. Um, and you know, not picking up on a headache, which is something that turns out to be an aneurysm or something else. It can happen to anyone as well. Um, but it's also and it's also making sure that there is enough in the notes to satisfy yourself um, that appropriate questions have been asked at the time. Okay, so the fifth case study, the difficult trainee, and I'm sure none of you have ever had a difficult trainee. So we've got Olivia who is at the end of her final um, six-month placement. She's at the standard that you would expect of someone almost at the end, but you've got some concerns, uh, particularly in relation to her communication style. So um, the feedback that you've had from patients is that she's abrupt, that she interrupts, that um, she's not interested, and when you have um, discussed issues with her regarding communication with patients, um, she very selectively interprets the information you give her. You're also finding that when you discuss um, questions with her, that um, she will go to your colleagues and you know, get a poll and then follow the advice that she she, she might selectively represent or selectively um, provide information to your colleagues and then follow their advice. So you have a lot of concerns about the level of insight that she has and whether or not she has any capacity to learn the parts of state. You bite the bullet, you sit down with Dr. Olivia and you give her some constructive feedback, but not surprisingly it goes really badly. Um, Dr. Olivia accuses you of doing or correcting her. She storms out of the, the practice, she 
she then sent you an email to say she's taken stress leave. Um, she's not coming back. Uh, she'll come in on the weekend, pick up her belongings and leave the fees. You let the training provider know and you allocate out the patients that are going to be to see what they will be over the next fortnight. Six weeks later, a letter arrives from Arthur and you are asked to respond to a complaint about bullying or harassment which has been made about you by Dr Olivia. Dr Olivia also alleges in her complaint that she believes you may have an impairment because um, you spoke to her and in a, an inappropriate manner and you appeared very agitated. While you're digesting that, your next patient comes in and she shows you a letter she's received from Dr Olivia. And the letter says, um, I want to welcome you to the new practice that I'm setting up directly opposite to your practice. Uh, um, this practice will be open in this next slide. What do you do? Get some advice. So, if, if got, you ring me and you tell me what's happened, we, we'll separate out the issues. So, what we need to deal with immediately and the first priority is responding to the complaint from Arthur. So, what I want from you is I want a copy of the complaint, I want you to prepare a summary of your conversation with Dr Olivia that precipitated her leaving. Um, I want any documentation you have regarding, so we can get file notes um, and um, of any discussions you might have had, if there is anything um, in terms of patient complaints that you've recorded, um, I want all of that as well. And getting down and doing a chronology is really, really helpful for your insurer as well. Um, and it helps us provide a really detailed response because um, there are always two sides to the story and she's gotten in first and told Arthur her version of events and what we need to do now is we need to provide a factual version of what has occurred. So, um, and I guess from the insurer's perspective, um, what we want to do is we want to make sure that um, there's no emotion in your response either because it's it's very hard to be objective when a complaint is personal, particularly when it's, it's unfair and particularly when it's about you as well. So um, having a third person assist you to draft it, um, then that can make a big difference in terms of taking the emotion out of it and making it entirely um, factual and objective. Okay, so your insurer will help you draft the response. Now, Someone's already um, raised the restraint of trade clause, which is exactly what I'm talking about now. So, second part, and can she set up as a trainer? As a trainer, set up a kind of well, that's sort of assuming that she's getting through the program and she can start up. What she could also do is that you don't need to be qualified um, to set up your own practice. I mean, people who are not medicos can start up practices as well. So. Um, it could well be that she's the front for someone else. Um, questions just come up. What does the medical um, indemnity insurer do if they insure part, both parties? You know what? That does happen. What we do is we all have um, we have complex protocols in place. So um, uh, what we do is that when we identify that there's a conflict between two different doctors, they manage by two different claims managers. Um, if needs be, um, if we manage claims out of Sydney, we manage claims out of Perth. If needs be, we'll transfer it either to Perth and it's managed out of a different office. Or what we'll do is we'll instruct different solicitors um, to advise each doctor individually. So um, from our perspective, if we, if I have, um, uh, if I have Dr Olivia, then my advice is direct to her. If I'm advising the supervisor, I don't care what Dr Olivia has done, I'm not interested in her at all. All I'm interested in is protecting um, my doctor, the supervisor, and making sure they get the best possible outcome. So we're able to do that and I think most insurers are able to do that. 
we just have a system where we flag these as potential issues. So if either of our matters ever discussed at a meeting or whatever, the other person is out of the way. Um, so um, I would think there'd be a restraint of trade clause. And again, it will depend on what the nature of the contractual relationship is. And having seen different sorts of contracts, I wouldn't begin to advise you on what would the content of the contract would be. But certainly restraint of trade, solicitation patients would be, I would expect to be part of any working arrangement. Um, the other thing is how did Dr Olivia get that information about from patients? I would be going in and I would be, you know, when you get your IT person you do it yourself and you find out whether there's been any data downloads. My suspicion would be that when Dr Olivia came in on the weekend um, and took her possessions, maybe she downloaded some data as well, put on for a fun drive or something like that. So what you want to do is you want to check your records and see whether there's been any inappropriate um, downloads. Um, you, there, there would then be, if you find that there has been a mass download of what we call it patient data, then you, um, you may then have obligations in terms of um, uh, making a complaint about the privacy commissioner, the office of the information commissioner. Um, Again, that's something you'll, you can discuss with your insurer. Okay, so um, uh, most insurance policies will contain some cover for employment disputes, which this certainly sounds like, um, or they'll have cover for if, if you've got a practice policy, um, then you may well have cover in terms of theft of intellectual property. So the first step will often be a plea for or cease and desist, um, particularly if you've found that data has been downloaded. You send a letter saying return it immediately, um, you must destroy all copies um, uh, and if it's on a solicitor's letterhead that often has far more import than you bring her up or emailing her um, uh, to ask for a return of the information. Okay, so look, there are five very different case scenarios um, and I guess in terms of what I want you to think about, um, so starting from the beginning, have you got criteria in which the supervised doctor must contact you? Have you satisfied yourself as to the skill level and capabilities of the supervised doctor and the level of supervision that's needed? Do you have appropriate professional identity cover and have you checked your supervised doctor has a current policy. You're entitled to ask that. So I would be asking for a certificate of privacy from um, your trainer if you don't already do that. Um, have you made it clear to the supervised doctor what procedures they can and cannot perform? And do you have a plan in place for when things go wrong? So say for whatever reason um, something happens, the suture and a wound and they nick a blood vessel or something, do they know what you have to do when something goes wrong? Like? Okay, so I don't want to put you off the line of supervision to trainees. It's such an important part of medical practice um, and you provide an invaluable service. I guess what I'm hoping by this talk is that you'll be alert, not overly alarmed, and you'll have an awareness of possible risks that may arise. As I said, risks can't be completely eliminated, but you can reduce risks significantly by being aware of the things that are really important in terms of supervising your um, registrars or your um, training. Um, I guess the other thing, so knowledge of potential risks and being aware of where you can go. So what do I need to do? Who do I need to call? Um, where do I go? That's a really important part of it as well. And also getting on top of things when they arise. I mean, we all have situations where um, you know, it's difficult to take action because it's going to involve dealing with something that's unpleasant. But I can reassure you that the quicker you deal with things, the, the better the outcome is likely to be. Patients um, will be aggrieved if you they believe you're concerning things from them or you haven't acted on things and you have a reasonable um, suspicion um, and you didn't act on it. So 
Um, bear all these things in, in mind. Don't hesitate to seek help. Um, and as I said, you are providing an invaluable service and we want to help you continue to do so. Okay. Um, all right. I'm just having a look at So something's just popped up there that says, as a trainee, I was told if you're nice and talk to people, you nearly get away with murder. Later, I was told by lawyers, don't talk to the person making a complaint. It may be interpreted as trying to influence them. That can be right. So if you'll find all complaints body, if, if a patient makes a complaint to the health care complaint commission or to ARCA, what they will say in their letter to you is, please don't discuss this with the patient. Um, that is correct as a general rule. If there's a situation where you're aware that a patient has said something back to a practice staff, it may be appropriate for you to contact them. It's very different if there's a formal complaint or there's a claim and the person has legal representation. You should not be speaking to them under any circumstance. I have had matters where someone's made a claim or complaint and then has wanted to come back to the doctor saying, oh, you know, it wasn't personal. Well, you have the right also not to see people who um, you feel uncomfortable about what has happened. So it's not just one side of the world. Okay. Um, is there anything that I need to address, Glenn? Uh, just having a look through the questions now. Uh, okay, you, you answered the question about if uh, both parties were in, indemnified together. I have a lot of chat, guys. It's awesome. Uh, do we need to give all patients instructions in writing? I'll just, I'll just uh, work my way from the follow all instructions, instructed steps to yeah. patients. Sorry, I'm working my way down because I don't think I got to the earlier one. So, um, one of the comments is registrar management can be a balance of many factors. How do we manage registrar with expectations? Um, their expectations are such that they often interrupt the consult, the telephone number, etc. That's a really difficult thing. Um, you know, you don't want to have the registrar not contact you because they think you're inaccessible or that you're going to get annoyed at them. But equally, I think it's quite appropriate for you to say, if it's not urgent, if you don't need to ask something about a patient, if it's a telephone number, then wait till I finish with the patient. So set the parameters and set their expectations. I would expect that if it's an emergency situation, you'd be happy to be um, uh, um, notified. Um, next one was, how much responsibility should the um, training provider take from forming their people in the registrar capacity? Look, I would expect you to get a detailed handover or summary from the registered training provider. You can't aggregate your responsibility also to make sure because, you know, it's not, it, it could happen that, um, one of your colleagues who's had the, um, the doctor at their practice has been fined about the capability. So you just want to make sure yourself that um, you're comfortable with them um, providing a certain level of, um, or not requiring a certain level of supervision as well. I think, uh, yeah, I think I've, I've pretty much answered most of the other ones um, during the course of the yeah, I think so, absolutely. Okay. And look, our apologies if we haven't been able to answer your question. There was quite a lot of content tonight. But what we will do is uh, field any questions that didn't get answered. Uh, and if Julie's able to answer them, we'll, we'll um, make sure that that information gets to you. So thank you very much, Julie, for your time. Um, it's been really interesting. We've uh, had people stay on a lot longer than they normally would. So thank you for also sticking around. Uh, if you've enjoyed this webinar, we have a, a range of other webinars. Keep in touch with us. So you can find out what which one is next on our website. We'd uh, like to thank again MDA National for their sponsorship of this session and thank Julie for her time in um, joining us after hours for her and uh, everyone else. So thanks very much. <laughs>